Now it's our turn to, uh, sorry for the words, but put our balls on the table. Remember, kids, this is not how you play hockey. It's just ugly. I like it. Here you guys. I'm doing this. You know what? I love ice cream, too. Go back to Canada, Guy Lafleur. Game on! Yeah, game on! Hello, la, 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 la. welcome into another episode of the Hockey Show right here on My High Sports, where we talk all things in the hockey world, Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show, if you didn't already know. I'm your host, J.J. Derez, with me, my guy of NHL.com, Ryan Bolding, here to break down all things going on in the hockey world. Luckily, Colorado's still involved in the hockey world right now, right? I mean, and you look back at the last two years and Normally, our hockey show goes throughout the uh, entirety of the playoffs, and here we were talking non-Avalanche hockey. Just exciting to still be talking Avs hockey on June 4th here. Makes our job a lot easier. It really sure. does. It yeah. really does. Because we're there. We're present. We're uh, involved. We're plugged in. We're plugged in. In the trenches, if Jacked you will. Jacked into the matrix. So, yeah, we got some stuff to get to. Matinee money, of course. There's no matinee game today, but we've got game three tonight, 6 o'clock. Avalanche versus Oilers. So of that, I'm going to stick with uh, a couple game props that I've uh, I dug into. First of all, I for, like this. Yeah. For, first of which is being Mike Smith on the saves over 32 and a half. I mean, the Avalanche have been peppering peppering him with at least 40 shots a game in both the first two games. So uh, as long as they don't score nine goals on 40 shots, I think that's a, a pretty easy over at minus 115. I like that one. Yeah, are you you doing it straight up? Or are you you parlaying? I'm going to straight up because, uh, you know, parlays have been kicking style. me in the behind. Yeah. With that, I'm going to go Nazem Kadri. I rode this one. I don't know if you got to see my awesome video from the top of Ball Arena before game two, but um, Nazem Kadri in game one had nine shots. Wait, you were on the roof? No, no, no. I was just uh, right next to it. Oh, like the 300 level. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. the top of the 300 level, if you will. Um, so Nazem Kadri in nine shots in game one. In game two, he had four, but two of them. Yeah, he really had six, but two of them were taken away. One ended up being a tip by Arturi Lekkonen, where they ended up giving him the goal rather than Nazem Kadri, and so that therefore took away the shot. And then another one, he uh, hit Mike Smith in the pads. If you looked at it closely, it was going wide. So he really, in my opinion, had six shots. They only gave him four shots on goal. So I think that's another three-and-a-half over hammer at minus 115. Same odds there. Yeah, that's looking good. And then lastly, McKinnon, same, same deal. Shots on goal. Last game, he had 11. So here, they're giving him four and a half over, but that's only a minus 140. So, you know, do with that one what you will, but I, I really like the first two. That's his second or maybe third of the postseason over 10. I know McCarr had 12 in a game, which I think leads the team for shots in a postseason game this year. Yeah, I mean, shots is the name of the game here, I think, for Jared Bednar against the Oilers, right? I mean, with the run and gun back and forth that we're seeing between these two teams and the two styles that they like to play, I think you're if you're the coach, you're thinking shot, 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 shot. Yeah, like, pour, like pour, little John. pouring like an avalanche coming down the mountain. <laughs> Let's get into uh, Tampa Bay versus New York. Of course, we're going to touch on that here. Next, we'll get into Edmonton, Colorado a little bit more in depth. And then Mark Lazarus of The Athletic will be joining us. Uh, he's been covering this series with us, so... It was easy uh, for us to rub shoulders with him, pull some strings, and say, hey, hop on the show. Let's talk this series a little bit. So that will be coming up at 12.30. That is correct. 12.30. Um, so, yeah, Tampa Bay, New York. Rangers are up 2 nothing. Of course, they took care of the home ice advantage. So Just like we all predicted. Exactly, right? I, I guess the, the home ice advantage may or may not play a factor in both series so far. I guess looking at the New York-Tampa Bay, considering what Tampa Bay is capable of and the way New York is playing, do you see Tampa Bay maybe getting back into the series and even it up at two? Or how do you, how do you predict the uh, next two games in Tampa Bay end up? I think it's far from over. You know, this round more so than any round, I think, is chess over checkers. But that said, New York looks good. Tampa's struggling. Maybe they had too much time off. Maybe they just don't have it. You know, I, I saw John Cooper's comments about Gerard Gallant they are friends but I I thought it was an incredible quote last game where he you know said give a lot of credit to Turk that this is a a team that plays a simple system but they work hard and that's the kind of the the highlight of every team that he coaches you know 
the the keynote is that it's a hardworking team. But the Rangers look fast, and they look lethal, and Tampa hasn't been able to keep up with it. And you you get a little bit of an Avalanche versus the Oilers vibe there too, where Colorado is a fast team. I guess it really, and you're hearing it a lot from around the hockey world. The New York Rangers, nobody really expected them. I mean, I don't want to say nobody, but a majority of people didn't expect them to be where they are today. Really, it seems like in a one of those situations where the team gets hot at the right time, right? Kind of like L.A. Kings of year back or Chicago Blackhawks of years back. Is that the case here with the Rangers? Is this a team getting hot at the right time? Or do you feel like there's something more to this team that maybe we missed how good they were throughout the regular season and coming into the playoffs? I think it's a little bit of both. I posed a question on Twitter earlier, uh, I think after game one, and I said, you know, does David Quinn accomplish this with this roster or does Gallant deserve credit for this? And a lot of people said Gerard Gallant deserves credit. And you look at what he did with the first year with the Vegas Golden Knights and took them all the way to the Stanley Cup final. It's not unheard of for him to coach a team that rises to the challenge, right? But at the same time, you have guys getting hot at the right time. Our Timmy Panarin is the one of the biggest Russian enigmas in the entire NHL. He's coming on. The Benajad scoring, Chris Kreider scoring. And Chris then you Kreider got, is out of nowhere for me. Yeah, you got guys like Kako. You've got Hedl scoring goals, you know, really coming into his own. When you have, you know, a team firing on all cylinders, you've got your, your talent scoring, you've got your depth scoring. You, you've you got a, a Russian maybe supplanting another Russian as the, the number one goalie in the, the postseason here. Like, it's, it's a, a thrilling matchup. But, yeah, I think the Rangers are hot at the right time. And they're really using their their speed, their skill, their youth uh, to their advantage. I think it's a, I guess, a bit disrespectful to the Rangers to say that they're simply getting hot at the right time because they are. They're getting hot right now. But I think that you look. I mean, you just named half their lineup right now. They have the tools. They have the pieces in place. I mean, they've got strong forwards. You just named them: Zabanejad, Panarin, Kreider, the kid line, and Lafreniere, Kako, and uh, she- Hedl. Hedl. Um you know, those guys are emerging right now. Of course, the back end, you got Truba, Fox, Keandre Miller. Those are big names. And Shesterkin in the back. I mean, they have the tools to, to be a great team. I don't know why we're all kind of surprised that they are. And they have speed. And I think that's something that's really working to their advantage. Uh, you know, we've I've seen some stuff from Mike Kelly uh, from, what is it, Sports Logic, And, uh, there, you know, some interesting stats about cross ice passes about high danger shots about these kinds of chances that you know the the rangers are creating that the the rangers created against carolina that they're doing against tampa it's it's an opportunity for them to use their skill set and they're doing it and that's what's the most impressive thing for me you know i mean even even today not to keep going back to the avalanche series but you know uh oilers coach jay woodcroft said this morning Um, you know, somebody asked him, is it what you're doing or what they're doing? And he said, you know, that's the big question, right? Is it us or is it them? And when you go and you look at video and you review plays, you think, is it what we're doing or is it what they're doing? And when you talk to players, a lot of the times they won't necessarily credit what the other team does. You know, it's if we did well, it was us. If we did poorly, it was us. But there's two teams into this equation. And I think just in this situation, the Rangers are playing with a it's what we are doing attitude and you can see it you know it's it's not a lot of what tampa's doing tampa scores first in that game early i thought it was a terrible uh power play call you know if you're gonna call what you called on ryan reeves in in game two there take both of them him and maroon send them both off i don't know the stick to the groin i think that's where the the line was crossed they're they're both sticking each other across the body all over the place but the groin is off limits ryan Listen, this is that's that's like that uh, kids game where you you got the guy don't break the ice or whatever it is you got the guy propped up with all the sticks sticks all over the body in this one, <laughs> call them both. But you know the the Rangers uh, really, to be as cliche as possible, no quit, really no quit, no quit in New York, huh? Right there on Forty Fourth, they ain't quitting. Um, looking at the goaltending coming into this series, that was the conversation, right? High flying Avs and Oilers goaltending probably not going to see many goals in this series first game was six to two last night finished three to two is goaltending still the highlight of this series i think what's interesting is we've seen in both series in this round like a a high scoring game and then a tighter game you know i mean tampa looked like 
it, they had a really strong opportunity to come back with the goalie pulled last night. You know, it was a tense minute and a half or whatever it was with the, the six on five. But I think, you know, goaltending is key in all the series. I don't think Darcy Kemper has looked particularly good before his injury. Uh, Francois comes in, has a shutout. He looked good. Mike Smith, very shaky in game one. I thought very good in game two. You know, things get a little out of control. If I were him, I would definitely want that Josh Manson goal back. You know, it's a clean shot that beats you kind of low, and you have a total line of sight on it. But on the other side, I mean, Vasilevsky, we've been saying for a long time, best goalie in the NHL for the first time in 1,145 days. They have lost back-to-back <laughs> playoff games. He was 17-0 and entering last night in games after a loss. Like, that's an incredible stat. It speaks to the, the team's ability to regroup, but his ability to just put a game behind him, right? Now you wonder, like, does doubt creep into Vasilevsky's mind? And, and for Shesterkin, he's playing with house money. Like, he's playing unbelievable. It kind of felt like it, when he gave up that first goal, Vasilevsky, against Keandre Miller, that looked like one that Vasilevsky normally has. So I think, yes the doubt might be creeping in because that didn't look like Vasilevsky and that didn't look like Vasilevsky or the Lightning on the second night of a, after a loss, right? And and you, as a goaltender, you tell me what you think about this. Vasilevsky has allowed 18 high-blocker goals, and New York has scored almost all of their goals high-blocker on them. They are shooting high-blocker. Like, the the book is out on Vasilevsky, and that is it. Hey, they found a hole and they exploited it. Why, why not? I, I like that. I mean, and it, it makes sense to me. And Blocker, maybe he's hurt. I think blockers often the the hole, the weakest part of a goaltender, no matter what, because you still got that weight, you know, right? You got a, a stick in your stick, hand, yeah. Um, so you got the weight of the glove and the stick. So I, I get it. Um, but the Rangers essentially came out of nowhere. I think that's really where the surprise lasts it, or it comes from, right? I, not because of the lineup, not because of the personnel they have. I don't, I don't think that's surprising at all. But looking at last year, they didn't even make the playoffs. Of course, it was a weird year, weird playoff structure. Looking at the year before, they didn't even get into the actual playoff. They were in the play-in round, but they didn't get out of that. So really, you know, last week we talked about paying your dues and experience in the playoffs and how much that helps you. I think that's the biggest surprising part of the Rangers is they don't have that. This is really their first playoff run with this group. This is their window opening wide in one year and them going right through it. Yeah, and it's a shame because I, I no, no disrespect to Chris Drury, I think he's going to get a lot of credit for this team that he doesn't necessarily totally deserve. You know, he did make a coaching change and, a, you know, some, some organizational changes, brings in Gallant. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe one of the, the most interesting decisions that is paying off is bringing in Ryan Reeves. And you have to think, Gallant having had him in Vegas, that he was very involved in saying, I think this guy needs to be part of this, right? And he takes penalties. You know, you love him or hate him. I know a lot of people in Colorado hate him from his time with Vegas. I've been very impressed with him this season and the and the postseason. And he's playing minutes. Like, he's not a he's not a Curtis McDermott that was played most of the regular season while guys were in and out of the lineup and then gone. You know, he's still out there. I don't believe in coincidences. And I'm not saying, I'm just saying, but Ryan Reeves – continues to play in conference finals. Yeah. Just leaving that there. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Right. And I said it the other night. I will I will send ten dollars to whoever I need to to get that Pat Maroon Ryan Reeves fight just at center ice. Just let him go. PPV, a little pay per view. Yeah. Just let him go. <laughs> right on, right on. I'm still waiting to see uh, you know, the the Avs get angry and maybe uh, throw some punches here and there. But we'll get into that here in the next segment. That'll do it for the first one already. We're flying through it here on a game day Saturday. Avalanche and Oilers, of course, set to do game three tonight at 6 o'clock. So stick around through the break. We'll be right back. Get more into that series. Break it down. Only two games to break down. Should be easy. We were at both of them. And then we'll talk to Mark Lazarus right after that and on his thoughts in the series. So we'll be right back. J.J. Jerez, Ryan Bolding right here on My Eye Sports. Danny Bailey behind the glass. Stick around. Right now it's 16 minutes past the big hour. Is that not right, Mr. Scream? <laughs> Great, good stuff. I think people are getting really cranked. Welcome back. This is the hockey show. Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show. Even Tracy Myers knows about it. Nick Consanica. We were talking to them before the game. 
the other day, and they're like, man, are you are you guys the ones that do Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show? We said, yeah, that's us. I'm JJ. He's Ryan. Let's get into the Avs and Oilers series. Avs up 2 nothing, a dominating 2 nothing, in my opinion. I mean, you look at the two games, and I don't think there's really uh, much in there to make me think that the Oilers have any sort of shot in this series. I mean, it's kind of what I expected going into it. I thought St. Louis was going to be the tougher series uh, throughout this stretch so far, and it's proven to be so. Let's get into Ryan's opinion, though. Do you see any reason to believe that the Oilers are going to get back in this and make this a series? Yeah, I mean, they have gotten this far for a reason. And do we see blowouts in this round of the postseason? Sure. I think often it comes down to who is the healthier team. And, you know, at least going into game one, these teams were healthy for the most part, right? The Avs were missing Sam Gerrard, and that was pretty much it. You know, you like to see two teams kind of going at it with their the full strength of their roster as opposed to, you know, like one team kind of limping down the stretch and getting put out of their misery. For me, the big question was, what does Mike Smith do here? You know, I, we watching that the Calgary-Edmonton series and the craziness, I was very much impressed with something that uh, Jay Woodcroft mentioned on media day for the, the Western Conference Final, which was, you know, the, the, they preach a principle of how to recover from mistakes the right way. So it's not getting down when a mistake is made. Mistakes are going to be made. Goals are going to in, go in, but it's how you recover from them. And when you apply that to the Calgary series, you're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, mistakes were made up and down the ice on both sides, but Edmonton really responded well. But knowing that, you're like, this Avalanche team is fast. They can score. And you've got one of the last, you know, dying vestiges of old school goaltending in net. I mean, we've talked about it before, like Marc-Andre Fleury and Mike Smith are like the last two of a different generation of goaltender, you know, uh, less textbook. And so that was the big question mark for me. And it, it still remains the big question mark until this series is over, right? Is, is Mike Smith from game two, who played almost perfectly, save for a three-minute stretch there, going to show up in this game? Or is it the Mike Smith from game one? And on the other hand, Darcy Kemper hasn't looked good since the Blues series. Uh, I would say that the general idea is that he took a puck to the face, maybe scrambled some eggs in his brain here, having a hard time seeing the puck, leaves the game. Francois comes in, looks pretty good, right? Miko Koskinen, however, looked pretty good when he came in in game one. So for me, it's, is Frankie able to hold up here? And if Kemper does come back, which Kemper are we getting? I think you can't do anything but feel good on Francouz right now, right? Because he did come into that first game, let in three goals, and you're like, all right, maybe Francouz isn't necessarily the answer. But then comes in game two. I mean, that was his first start in, what, two, three weeks since the Nashville series, since Kemper got right. the eye injury in, the, in that game four. Uh, he started game four. Um, so you look at Koskinen, and you're like, well, what if he could do the same? What if he was given the same opportunity to start a game know that he was going to start a game 24 hours prior, have that full day of preparation, and then be able to, to show what he's got. I don't think they're going to give him that chance because they believe in Mike Smith. But Mike Smith constantly rubs me the wrong way because he often throws up the hand on his defender, right? He gets scored on and he's like, what was that, Darnell Nurse? Or what was that, Tyson Berry? Right? He's, he loves to pass to, off to that To that blame. point, though, let's talk about the three goals in two minutes and four seconds in game two, right? I mean, the, the first one, I'm not even sure who makes the initial pass as a defenseman. Uh, but basically, like, from me to you, what are we, two, three feet apart? Whoever it is passes to Darnell Nurse two feet away from him. So if one guy is covering you, all he has to do is turn to be on me. So Nurse turns and throws it up the boards to a turnover, to a cadre shot, to a Lekin and tip in the net, right? And then the, I, don't, I don't even remember. Uh, the next goal is Josh Manson's goal. I don't even remember how that play comes about, right? But he has a clean lane. Nobody's there to to cover him. And then the third one is one of the many, many, many bad line changes that Edmonton had, not only in the game, but in the second period, where Darnell Nurse is going off the ice and then is the only man back on a two-on-one with Kadri and Rutman. Like, I mean, if you're Mike Smith, I I will give him a little leeway to be like, 
Well, that's fantastic, defenseman. Where have you been? WTF? Well, and that's and exactly- and Mike Kelly. I mentioned this before. Mike Kelly talked about it, and I I heard Jeff Merrick and uh, Elliot Friedman talk about it. But Edmonton has been really bad at defending two on ones, and I mean, basically, Nurse. Yep. You got to prevent the pass, and he doesn't. And the pass gets through every time. 100%. So some of it's Mike Smith, but some of it, I mean, the Oilers are making bad decisions, making mistakes. Well, I I don't know if that's as much a testament to the Oilers and maybe they're, you know, overachieving right now as much as it is the, the style of play from the Avalanche. I think, like you were talking in the last segment, is it us giving stuff up or is it them making opportunities for themselves? And I think that's the Avalanche because they cause havoc on the forecheck, right? They love to send two guys in. They love to press. They love to have those guys deep because they're so confident in the other three and their speed that even if the puck does get through, the defenders, Kale McCarr, Devon Taves, can handle it, as we saw with uh, Connor McDavid and Kale McCarr early in that first period, right? So I think you really got to credit the Avalanche for causing this chaos among the the Edmonton defenders. I mean, there was a shift in the last game where Jesse Pugliarvi was out there and literally three different Colorado lines got on the ice before he could even get off. He tried to get off and then ended up getting a too-many-men penalty because he tried to hop right back on because, again, the Avalanche were causing chaos. They weren't allowing right. Edmonton to even breathe. The neutral zone has been ran by Colorado. And We've seen it a little from Edmonton's side, too. But, yes, the Avalanche are doing a good job of that. I just don't think you could say, let's, let's say, you know, to be fair, maybe Edmonton has 10 bad line changes out of how many in a game, I don't know, right? You can't say the Avalanche caused all of them. You know, no, sometimes right. it's just bad line changes, but you know, you play, I play. I mean, a high zone turnover, when you have possession of the puck, if your team's changing, you're, I mean, you're screwed. It's, the neutral zone seems really small in that moment. So I think it's as much what the Avs do as what Edmonton is not doing. And maybe just not what they're used to seeing, right? I mean, L.A., Calgary, those are two different style teams, not trying to play with as much speed and tempo and north-south mindset as the Avalanche right. are. So, And to go back to your first question about whether or not the series is over, I mean, Edmonton was down one nothing to L.A., and they were down 3-2 to L.A., and they came back, and they were down one nothing to Calgary, and they came back. So, you know, it's not as if they haven't come back. They haven't been down by two, but I don't think that there is – any quit in this team, this team that was out of the playoffs, having gone, you know, two eleven and two. You're telling me there's no quit in Edmonton? Two twelve and two at one point in the season, you know, makes a coaching change, surges to where they are. You've got Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Dreisaitl's playing on at least half a leg. I don't even know if he's playing on a full one leg. Um, Darnell Nurse is hurt. You know, I mean, these are guys trying to get through it, but I think this is a real pivotal game. I'd said, uh, I said on the afternoon drive with Terry Fry yesterday, I think game two is going to turn out to be the real pivotal indicator of these series. And both teams that are up to nothing obviously won game two. So, I think Leon Dreisaitl, in my speculative opinion, has to be feeling better than we saw him in previous rounds because they put him on the second line as the center for game two. I don't think you can play center if you're working on a half a leg. So I, it's just my presumption that he might be feeling a little little better with that we saw the reports from morning skate today with tyler yamamoto being out for tyler. tonight tyler yamamoto uh zach cassian tyler's his brother tyler his, his evil twin with a mustache jerry mothra <laughs> jerry and terry mothra um zach cassian playing first line minutes i mean i don't know if you remember from game two but he he got i think it was a, a total of seven minutes and 33 seconds in the entire game and three minutes and 22 up until he got that penalty. So it seemed to me that uh, Jay Woodcroft was obviously not trying to play Zach Cassian because of the harm that he could bring your your lineup. Suddenly the uh, back and forth, the uh, aggressiveness, the nastiness starts to pick up, and Zach Cassian suddenly doubles his time on ice there at the end of the game, which is funny to me. But Zach Cassian hitting the first line, I guess it's a head-scratcher for me. What do you think Jay Woodcroft's thinking by putting uh, him with Connor McDavid and Evander Kane? If it's me, I think uh, there's kind of a, a couple things I'm looking at here. One is maybe the Val Nichushkin effect, right? Do we think Cassian is maybe as skilled as Nichushkin? From what I've seen from Nichushkin this year, maybe he didn't get enough credit previously for his skill, right? But what does he do well? What is he? What have we heard about what Nichushkin brings to the lines he's on from the team this season? Tenacity. 
and a strong forecheck. The guys say he forechecks hard and he digs the pucks out. That's what you're looking for from Cassian. Number two, Woodcroft has been saying this for two games worth of media conferences now. Uh, we need to be more physical on their defensemen, particularly Taves and Makar. I think, you know, you saw it a little bit. I, you know, Evander Kane catches Makar high. I don't think it was as egregious as everybody thought it was, you know, like trying to hit him in the face. It seemed like a, a twist that caught him up high. But they want to put bodies on these guys. I talked about it before. I've talked about it with people in the press box. I was shocked at how little the Blues played Colorado's defensemen physically, and I think part of that was they couldn't catch them. And it was talked about today. you gotta you got to be able to catch those guys to put bodies on them. And obviously, Makar, we saw him knock Eric Stahl out of a game with a hard hit after uh, Stahl was getting a little chippy. So he's not. it's not like Makar isn't physical. But when you have guys logging heavy, heavy minutes, putting bodies on them, finishing your checks on them all the time is going to take those minutes down because it's exhausting. It's exhausting to have a physical battle on top of all the footwork you got to do, right? So I think you've got Cassian coming in as a, a four-checker who can dig pucks out as a guy who can play the body, and then he's a guy you can just stick in front of Franco's and shoot pucks at. You know? Like, you you got to take a goalie's eyes away in this league anymore, and he provides that opportunity. Those are the three things that I look at when I see Zach Cassian playing on the top one. I think that's a really good assessment, uh, but the first thought I have is, okay, Kale McCarr was pretty much held to not himself in round two, and the reason for that was Ryan O'Reilly and their defensive mindset and that top line. The Edmonton's version of Ryan O'Reilly is Zach Cassian, you're telling me? That doesn't strike me as a, a okay, leveled up. That's fair, but I'm not saying... So Ryan O'Reilly was a commitment to defense first. I'm talking about when when Edmonton has the puck, right? Yep. You dump the puck in Get on Kale McCarr yep. and let him hit him. And then the, the other thought I have is, why is Kyler M Yamamoto out of the game? It was a Gabe Landeskog hit, right? Presumably. I mean, he played... That was in the first period. And he played through into the almost the end of the second period before he left. So we don't know that for certain. I just wonder, I mean, that's my thought too. Is, is Zach Cassian getting thrown in there, like you said, to throw the body in the forecheck, but also, you know, to make sure Landeskog feels his presence a little bit and they answer back. Because, you know, Connor McDavid, as chippy as he's trying to be, all he can really do is deliver a cross check. Uh, Evander Kane definitely sends a message. So having two guys out there with Connor McDavid, I think you get a little bit more of a rough and tumble style. And that might be what they're after here. Well, and the other thing is, you know, in, in Colorado, Jared Bednar got final say on which line matched up. And, you know, Jay Woodcroft got Connor McDavid and Evander Kane away from some of the, the matchups, you know, in game two. But he has final say in these two games in Edmonton. So he can really, you know, get Connor McDavid and, and Leon Dreisaitl and Evander Kane out against different pairings, you know, because he has final say on these changes. So we'll see how that factors into it. It may not be a straight, you know, McCarr and Taves on McDavid scenario. And I don't think that McCarr and Taves looked particularly good in game one. They have looked good in, in game two, but we're going to see. You know, I've seen a lot made out of how McCarr is playing McDavid in this series and winning, but I don't know that that's entirely accurate over the whole lifetime so far. Yeah, the ball's in Edmonton's court as far as adjustments go. I think if you're Colorado, you just keep playing the same game, right? That's the plan. That's how they've been all season. We just stick to our game and we play our game and we don't let the extracurriculars get out of control and all that jazz. Right on. So we'll see what Mark Lazarus has to say about all these adjustments and uh, who might come out with the upper hand once it's all said and done tonight. So stick around. We'll get to Mark Lazarus of The Athletic next right here on The Hockey Show, Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show. J.J. Jerez, Ryan Bolding, Coach Bailey behind the glass. We'll be right back. Let's go, Colorado. Welcome back. It's the hockey show, Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show, being brought in by La Bamba there, Ryan. We'll get into that, the reason why in a second, but we're heading to the phones here. Heading to Edmonton. Mark Lazarus of The Athletic joins us. Just finished up morning skate not too long ago. Mark, thanks so much for hanging out with us. I saw your tweet last night about the Ed Edmonton night sky, and uh, it didn't really hit twilight till almost 11 o'clock. So I guess it, how beautiful is Edmonton in June? You know, I've been here, I don't know, like 12, 15 times over the last 10 years. I always liked this city, but I've never been here 
when there's not been the snow on the ground. This is a lot better. I, I bet. I wonder I wonder if Winnipeg is the same. Just curious. I was, you know, I, I was once here. It was uh, minus 50, I think it was, Celsius. Oh. It, it, it was so cold that the uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius had merged into the same number. <laughs> and I forgot to pack gloves on that trip. And I had a 10-minute walk back to my hotel, and I thought I was going to die. Well, thank goodness you're there in June. Thank goodness. <laughs> Mark's been covering uh, the Avs Oilers series, so we've been uh, hanging out with him for the last couple games. And I guess let's just get into your overall opinion of this series. I mean, we knew it was going to be a high-flying series. We were promised a lot of goals. It was delivered. But I guess from an entertainment standpoint, do you think this series has delivered? Or are you a little bit underwhelmed by Edmonton's inability to, to, I guess, make it super competitive so far? Well, obviously, Game 2 wasn't quite as, uh, as as entertaining as Game 1 was. Game 1 certainly lived up to the hype, the uh, no-defense, all-offense hype that we all kind of wanted to mm-hmm. see. Maybe, I'm sure, Jared Bednar and Jay Woodcroft didn't want to see that, but it was fun for the rest of us. You know, it's always interesting when you come into a series like this. Like, I know the Avs, and I know the Oilers, but I don't, I'm not, like, you know, intimately uh, aware of all their little, you know, uh, intricacies and all that. So when you come in and you parachute in on a series like this, the things that stand out to you are probably things that you guys take for granted seeing the avalanche every day. And, like, you know they're fast. But when you actually see them in person against the other fastest team in the league, it's kind of mind-blowing to watch Kale McCarr and Nathan McKinnon and, you know, Devon Taves and, and Bowen Byron to watch them go. It's like, oh, you know, I've been watching the Blackhawks the last five years. This is, this is what hockey used to look like for me. You know, this is incredibly fast and deep and talented team. And uh, after watching a lot of uh, grinded-out AHL-style hockey for the last few years, it's really nice to see fun hockey again. I definitely feel that way. Maybe we take a little bit of, for granted Nathan McKinnon and Kale McCarr because they're fast. You, you see McKinnon score on that breakaway just going right through Darnell Nurse oh, yeah. uh, on that goal. But on the other hand, I do appreciate getting to see Connor McDavid go to work in person. He's a guy like Sidney Crosby, you know, Patrick Kane maybe a couple years ago that you really enjoy getting to see live. But, Mark, you mentioned the Blackhawks, and you, you covered Stanley Cup winning Blackhawks hockey as well as what we've seen recently. Just in your mind, you know, how do the – what both of these teams bring, but maybe more so the Avalanche thus far, how do they compare to, to a Stanley Cup champion Blackhawks team that you've covered? Well, I mean, once you get to this stage of the playoffs, everybody's got some superstars, right? Everybody's got a great first line. Just about everybody's got a great second line. It's that depth that really separates the team. Like the Blackhawks, back in 2013, their fourth line was uh, Marcus Kruger, Dave Boland, and Michael Froelich. That could have been like a second line on some teams that year. So that's what really separates you. And the Avalanche have the depth that the Oilers simply just don't have. The Oilers are, you know, McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Evander Kane, and that's largely it. But, you know, the, the Avalanche have, you know, you, when you got J.T. Comfer and, uh, you know, Logan O'Connor and Andrew Cogliano contributing, it makes such a difference. Uh, they're playing good, solid defense. They can kick on some tough matchups. They're chipping in with goals. And then when you got a top three of your defense of uh, Makar and Taves, and you got you know Byron back there, uh, you know with Gerard when he's healthy. I mean, it, it's just the Avalanche are built like a Stanley Cup team, and that's why they were a trendy pick to win the Cup this year. That's why they won however many games they won. Is they are built to win. Now they, what they don't have is that experience yet, right? They haven't been tested, and you know every team has to go through that. The Blackhawks did that in 2009 when they lost to the Red Wings in the conference final. They came back, and then they won three cups in six years. And they had this indomitable will. This un- They were just unkillable. You know, No matter what the situation was, they had a killer instinct when they were up, and they had a big F you to everybody when they were down. They were going to come back and win. Avalanche haven't reached that yet. You kind of have to win before you get to that point. But this team is built in a way where if they do win the cup this year, you'll see them like Tampa is right now, where you know Tampa's not – they're down 2-0. They're probably not sweating much about it, right, because they know what they can do. And that's the, that's the level the Avalanche have to get to. That's the next step, is winning a championship and realizing that you can do just about anything. And, Mark, you mentioned the, the depth differences, and specifically on defense. I wanted to get your thoughts on just Edmonton's defensive situation. Darnell Nurse, obviously not 100%. I mean, the, the third pairing of Tyson, Tyson Berry and Brett Kulak, I think, are getting pretty overwhelmed. You know, does Edmonton have the, the, the six defensemen or seven if they choose to do so? defensemen that can contain this avalanche team well even when they're healthy i mean the oilers defense is middling right it's not like it's a great defense and with darnell nurse clearly hurting uh i mean he's just getting blown by left and right you mentioned that mckinnon goal in game one where he just exploded right by him and nurse just stood there like what the hell am i supposed to do with this um i i don't think the oilers have like look 
there's no way the Oilers are winning four out of the next five games against this Avalanche. Let's face it. The question is whether they can win a game or two and extend the series, just make it competitive, because they can't. They can't contain what the Avalanche have. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Darcy Kemper and Pavel Fran- Frantos. Frantos. I've been just calling him Frankie. It's easier. Yeah, it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I honestly don't think it really matters. I mean, the goaltending would have to be so horrific for Colorado to lose with Mike Smith in the other end and that defense. It's just not good enough. They, the, 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 you know, Connor McDavid is the greatest player in the history of hockey. He has carried this team this far. It's amazing to watch. I don't think he can do that against a team as good as Colorado. He came, you know, in the Pacific Division, maybe he can pull that off. But not against Colorado. Wouldn't have worked against St. Louis either. This is the Hockey Show with J.J. and Ryan. We're talking to Mark Lazarus of The Athletic. You brought up Pavel Fransos there. We'll stick with Frankie for now. Uh, I guess we've been watching him emerge for the last three, four years. He's ne- he's always come in and had a great showing, never really been able to keep his grip on that starter position. But I guess what's the national perception of this guy? How much under the, or, I, I guess, on everybody's radar has he been, especially now that he's emerged in these playoffs? I mean, up until two days ago, there probably wasn't a national perspective on him, right? Right. I mean, you know, everyone in, 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 in their own city and on their own fan base is obsessed with the backup goalie. It's like, <laughs> it's like the backup quarterback. It's always the most popular guy in town, right? I, that, but Pavel Francouz, you know, at least half of the fans in, the, in, in, in North America couldn't name the Colorado backup goalie until two nights ago, let's be honest. That's just the way it is. But, um, you know, in the last couple of days, talking to people around the league, that they're, they're pretty high on him. Um, actually, I had a, I was talking to a scout for a story today, and he said he, he really likes the third string goalie, um, whose name is escaping the Finnish guy, Used to Sandinen. Sandinen, yes. yes. Like he said, said that he's one of his favorite goalie prospects in the league. So there's a lot to like there too. And obviously, Francois was able to come in in a, in a difficult situation against a high powered team and shut him out. So there's there's some skill there, and it's not like Darcy Kemper was lighting the world on fire at the end of that St. Louis series. He was clearly struggling. Uh, he gave up and he gave up six goals, a whole bunch of goals in game one here. So whether it's the eye, whether it's some other injury he's dealing with, he doesn't seem like he's at 100%. So a healthy Francois sure seems to be a better option right now than Kemper, who, you know, wasn't at his best through these playoffs. Mark, you mentioned Connor McDavid. We know he, he put this team on his back and got them to where they are. He's put this team on his back during the postseason, and a lot was made about McDavid and McKinnon going head-to-head in this series, right? But I think what we're seeing emerge is the, the Kale mccarr Connor mcdavid battle going on offense versus defense here. Just what are your thoughts on on who's winning this kind of battle and, and how the Avalanche have done a good job of containing a guy like McDavid? Well, yeah, I mean, McDavid was was largely invisible in game two, and that, that never happens in the Connor McDavid game. And you had that play, and I think it was the first shift of the game where, you know, McCarr went stride for stride with him going backwards and then just calmly one-handed the puck off of McDavid's stick. That doesn't happen very often. But it's not really McDavid versus McCarr, right? I mean, it's, it's 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 always a five man checking unit, and what the the Avalanche did really well in Game Two was, you know, they, uh, Jared Bender had the matchup advantage. He had the last change. He was able to get his top guys out against their top guys, and they did a good job shutting them down. The question is, can they do that in Edmonton when Jay Woodcroft has the last change? You know that he's going to try to get McDavid more favorable matchups. Uh, he put Zach Cassian on his line in morning skate today. We'll see if that sticks. But maybe you know, Evander Kane keeps talking about he wants to get. They want to be more physical. They want to get in the. Uh, the Avalanche's face, they tried that in game two, didn't make any difference. But when you have the last change and you get the matchups you want, maybe that'll make a difference. But, you know, McDavid had three points in game one, but it's not like he took over that game. Um, so you have to like what the Avalanche have done as a team, as a, as a five-man unit against him so far. I want to get into those adjustments and exactly what you uh, brought up there with Zach Cassian getting some first-line minutes, especially, you know, he wasn't heavily utilized in either of the first two games. Your thoughts on, I guess, the... Aside from just the physical presence, is there any more motivation on putting Zach Cassian up there with Kane and McDavid? And what other adjustments are you seeing Edmonton throw at us for tonight from today's morning skate? Well, I mean, it's hard to tell because Woodcroft wouldn't even commit to those being the lines. I mm-hmm. mean, you certainly assume that's going to be the lines, but, you know, there's a little subterfuge with the way things looked uh, at the morning skate in the last game, too. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, Cassian brings him more of an edge, obviously. He's had success with McDavid in the past. But I think, you know, when you're down 2-0 in a series and you absolutely have to win this game, the leash is going to be short. If that line doesn't click in the first, you know, it might last a period. It might last five shifts. You might see Dreisaitl and McDavid reunited. Whatever it's going to take, Woodcroft is going to push every button he has to try to make something happen because they obviously can't afford to lose this game. This is as desperate as desperate gets. So 
Um, I think all options are on the table at this point. I think you're going to see a lot of different. Uh, I don't. I, you know, Woodcroft has not been shy about changing things up so far in this series because if it's not working, he can't just stick with it. That's that's madness. Last one for me, Mark. Uh, I know you mentioned it would probably take a Herculean effort here to overcome the Avalanche in this series, but are you a bold enough man to make a prediction for this game tonight? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I'm st- I, I have a hard time seeing the Avalanche lose, but it's hockey. Hockey is dumb. Anything can happen in hockey. I will say the Avalanche will win this one four to three. That sounds like a some kind of a, a halfway between the, the the insanity of game one and the calmness of game two. I dig it. Uh, so we saw a story from Ryan Clark today uh, about La Bamba. I'm just curious your thoughts. Have you had a chance to read it and and take in kind of the? Uh, I guess it's like this year's version of Play Gloria for Edmonton. Right. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful story. Ryan does such a good job with stuff like that. But uh, no, it, it's always nice when you have like a a rallying cry and a and a and a, and a, a good story behind it. As opposed to just like. You know, when the Blackhawks picked Chelsea Dagger, however many years ago, it was just, yeah, this song has a lot of doo 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 in it that you can sing. <laughs> That'll it's be nice stuck in my head the rest of the day, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Welcome to my world, buddy. It's, uh, you could have, you know, it's, it's nice when there's a nice story behind it and it has some meaning and the players are, you know, are involved in that. And, and it, 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 it's, it's a really nice story. And, you know, will, will we hear it again this series? I don't know. But it's, uh, you know, Edmonton wants to. Mark, thanks so much for being so generous with your time. Enjoy the game tonight out in Edmonton. And, uh, Honestly, we hope we don't see you for Game 5, but uh, maybe we hope we see you in the final here. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, Mark. There you have it, Mark Lazarus of The Athletic. He just, uh, I mean, being in the press conferences with him the last couple games, he's a media member that absolutely understands the X's and O's of the game, which is so refreshing, especially seeing all these newbies that come in that we've gotten into. I love hearing his questions and the way he thinks the game and the way he processes it. So nice get. Good job, uh, booking department. Thank you. Thank you. I like this La Bamba story. If you have an opportunity to check it out on The Athletic, our friend of the show, Ryan Clark, uh, wrote a fantastic story about the the significance of Joey Moss to the organization and what his loss has meant and, and what his connection to the Oilers has done for the community and how much he loved that song. And they've kind of you know, brought it in, and it's not the original. Obviously, Richie Valance did the original, um, and the version they're playing is the Los Lobos version from the the movie. And so Ryan Clark gets into that with the band a little bit uh, and talks about how that came about and what they think of it. And for me, it's kind of it touches a personal note because my uncle was friends with the band, and uh, uh, Dave Hidalgo in particular. And I, I'm sure I've seen Los Lobos some. You know, my dad listens to Los Lobos, and we lost my uncle in March, but I think he would have thought this was awesome. I don't, wow. I don't think he would, JJ just checking his phone in the middle of this heartwarming moment for me. I, I think, I don't think he would have liked that it wasn't the Avalanche, because he'd go to Avalanche games and be an Avalanche fan, but uh, I think he would have thought it's cool, this kind of uh, increased attention that Los Lobos is getting, you know, as kind of an, an unknown band in a younger crowd kind of world, but. I was checking because I, I know Los Lobos, but I had to double check that I, it was the right song because I bumped into a song of theirs about two years ago that I'm absolutely in love with, and I play it every Christmas time. It's called Mamacita, and it says, Mamacita, donde esta Santa Claus? It's a perfect holiday song, so don't forget it next time uh, Christmas rolls Christmas around. List. It's a good one. Um, but that'll do it for this portion. Thanks again to Mark Lazarus for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll be right back for the Mixed Bag Skate and wrap up today's episode of the hockey show. J.J. Jerez, Ryan Bolden, Coach Bailey behind the glass right here on Mile High Sports. We'll be right back. I play hockey and I fornicate because it's the two most fun things in cold weather. Yet here we are in June, and those are still the most two fun things. Are they not? Danny coming in hot with the nine-inch nails for me. I love it. You weren't even listening to me. You're just listening to nine-inch nails. I'm, I'm sorry. Were you talking? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, one quick thing I wanted to get to, a little housekeeping. Uh, Housekeeping. For my real estate side of the game, right? a lender that I work closely with and I were throwing a watch party at Brooklyn's on Monday night for game four. If you want to come hang out, come hang out. We'll get you your first drink and you can enter to win uh, a couple avalanche autograph prizes and some Rockies tickets, stuff like that. It'll just be a fun little time. Hang out with me and uh, my favorite lender. That's I, it. I never turn down free drinks. Well, are you, are you, is that a commitment? No, I won't be there. Oh, but. Okay. <laughs>
Let's get into the mixed bag skate. Couple things to get to. But here. everybody else should go. I agree. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, including you. That's the point to the camera. You like that? Um, let's get into Daryl Suter winning the Jack Adams. Sutter. Sutter. Suter. Whatever you want. I say Suter. Here's how I think of it. Well, here's one how I think. One T is Ryan Suter. Okay. Two T's is Daryl Sutter. Okay. Yeah. I'll go with it. You're welcome. Sure. Well, anyway, Daryl Sutter. Suter Sutter wins the Jack Adams. I guess my only thought is, has this award become a new coach of the year award rather than just coach of the year? I've been arguing about this. I feel like my entire life this year, I think it should be a legacy award, an accomplishment over a period of time. I get you want it to be coach of the year, but I think you need to consider past experience. However, I do think he did well with Calgary sure. this year. Mm-hmm. He increased the team's average goals per game by more than one and made them much better defensively. And they were a force to be reckoned with down the stretch Jake there. Markstrom is a Vesna finalist. He has a, a, a fantastic season. Mm-hmm. Fantastic season. Well, that's fantastic. But then we look at the playoffs and <laughs> <laughs> for both of them. And it's a regular season award, but <laughs> you, you do – want to see some sort of legacy here where it's not just like the team was good one year and now they're gone, right? I think Jared Bednar deserves consideration. He finished fifth. I think John Cooper deserves consideration. He finished eighth. I think, yeah, I don't like that. It's just like most improved team award. 100%. And you've heard it um, so much from guys like Jeff Merrick, right? I mean, how obnoxious does it get that a hot goalie makes a a hot coach, right? A Vezina finalist goaltender. Ooh, he's hot. Classic. Chances are uh, he, the coach is going to be right there for the Jack Adams as well. So, um, yeah, I think a little bit more needs to be, I guess, examined before making our decisions for the Jack Adams. I mean, again, not that he doesn't deserve it, but it seems to be the exact same rubric for who wins it every single year. Hot goalie, new coach, you get the award. Yeah, it just, I mean, it comes to a point where you're like, what does John Cooper and, and Jared Bednar have to do here? 100%. It's like Jared Bednar missed his chance just by having one bad year that first year. And I wrote about it for Colorado Hockey Now. He, I asked Bednar, I said, while we're talking about awards, do you think you deserve a Jack Adams? And he said, no, I don't think I I deserve one. I haven't accomplished what I want to accomplish, and I don't think I deserve it. And then he went off about how he literally has changed the game by you know rotating systems and making teams adapt to him and things he's done, teams like Boston have started doing. Keeping F3 and all this high. Stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, so you literally just said no and then in detail describe to us why you deserve to have won one or win one. Indeed. Let's make shirts. Bedsy for Adams. I've died on this hill all season. All right. I'm dead. Sticking with coaches, Martin St. Louis gets extended in Montreal. I don't think it's surprising considering what he was able to accomplish in his short time there, especially considering Joel, uh, Cole Caulfield. Not Joel Caulfield. <laughs> Joel Caulfield. <laughs> His evil brother with a mustache. That's, yeah. that's Joel. But Cole Caulfield um, really ha- found a resurgence in his game there towards uh, the end of the season, and Martin and St. Louis had everything to do with that. So they're giving him another shot, see if he can reproduce that success that he experienced there down the stretch. I mean, the man literally came out of coaching his kid's Bantam hockey team into the NHL and did a good job. And, you, I mean, there's a new coach bump, right? But, I mean, there might be something to this. The best thing I saw is he came out of nowhere, and maybe we should stop doubting Martin St. Louis. He went undrafted, and look what he did. Well, Martin St. Louis, he's going to be a first-year coach next year for the whole year. He's getting his goalie back and Carey Price. So can we Make just write break. him in? Jack Adams winner? Jack Adams winner, Martin St. Martin Louis. St. Louis. You heard it here first. Exactly. Um, last thing I wanted to get to, Jordan Bennington and the uh, clean-out interviews, right, as St. Louis was emptying their lockers and throwing things away. I appreciated his candor about this. Shedding tears on the season that was. Jordan Bennington came out and called the water bottle-throwing incident a God-given opportunity. Um, I like the way he broke it down. I understand it. I understood it from the get-go. I mean, he was frustrated. He was angry. His season was done. Yeah, you're hurt. And you hear, here's a guy laughing and doing a TNT interview with, you know, Wayne Gretzky and Paul Bissonnette and Rick Tockett and Liam McHugh and Anson Carter, McHugh, Anson Carter. And you're like, my season's over. Did you well, see- that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. It, it was a meme, I guess, the God-given opportunity thing, but um, whatever, Jordan Bennington, he's kind of an idiot. Did you see the crowd hold outside on, hold on, hold on, Ball hold on. Arena? People will blame God for anything. 
or a credit god for anything these days. Like, oh, it was a god-given opportunity to throw a water bottle the Lord near me. near the feet of Nazagadri. Yeah, the clouds parted <laughs> in Enterprise Center, and uh, and a voice came to me and said, "Throw this bottle." Throw it at Nazem Kadri. Show me what you got. <laughs> uh, did you see the crowd outside Ball Arena following Game 2 victory with the uh, TNT panel out there and the crowd just getting insanely lit? I didn't. I was too busy working. You, you don't look on social media? You don't? I'm, I'm right on deadline, bro. That's stressful. Whatever. Maybe next. I didn't see it. I heard about it. I heard that it was awful television because you couldn't hear a word that they were saying. It was just abstain screaming. And then later I saw a little bit of video and I was like, man, they, these people are fools. But you did see it. I didn't. I saw pictures. You lied to it. my face. I didn't lie you to You lied nothing. right to my face. It was a God-given opportunity <laughs> to distract you and I took it. I heard the clouds parted. The lights came on. A voice from up high said... There's no quit in the hockey show. Make the poop sound. <laughs> All right, Ryan. That's twice in the same segment. Now I'm out of here. I quit. I'm out of here. I'm done. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. This week's episode of the hockey show. Enjoy game three tonight. It's going to be a good one. And, you know, chances are if the Avalanche win, this series is donezo. So, uh, yeah, let's see how they fare and what, uh, what happens. But, again, thanks for hanging out with us. This is the hockey show. We'll see what they got. See you later. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>